welcome everyone. Uh, nice that you are here for the premiere talks, the second day of the premiere uh, talks. Uh, I will have, uh, my name is Kim Knoppers, I'm a curator at FOAM, and um, I will have very short conversations with artists um, whose work is um, uh, premieres here at, uh, at Unseen. And here uh, at the table are Elina Broteris and uh, Mai Tami, uh, both from Finland, uh, by coincidence. Um, and uh, we will start with Elina. Um, I had the same problem yesterday. Um, Elina, you are uh, represented by uh, Camera Obscura Galleria de Art uh, with a series with a genius title, Carpe Fucking DM, uh, a series in which vividness, beauty, and melancholy come together. Um, and um, uh, I was wondering, autobiography is always key in your uh, body of work. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about a previous series that you did um, called Annunciation before talking about Carpe Fucking DM? Autobiography has been like coming and going in my practice since I started photography in the mid 90s. Uh, the very beginning was, I would say, like true, simple autobiography. Then I went into more like art historical or formal issues in photography. And then something like 10 years later, something happened in my life and then I, it was kind of, I, I didn't plan it, but autobiography just came or sneaked back into my practice. So I think that's like a strategy I have as an artist that I didn't plan it, but I didn't hinder it either. So those images that need to come, I let them come, and I accept them. Um, Annunciation is uh, referring to the, uh, the theme in, in, let's say, from Renaissance art onwards, where the, the, the angel is coming to announce to, to Mary that she will get pregnant and she will give birth to a boy. Well, I'm not religious in any way, but I'm interested in art history and I particularly love that, that painting or, or that theme because it's, it's something that is very intimate and it was something that was very present in my life at that moment. Or let's say that the, the, the series Annunciation is actually a series of false annunciations because the angel didn't show up. So to, to make a long story short, um, I was trying to, to have a child, and I didn't. And because I'm a photographer, I was lucky to, to be a photographer, I had something meaningful in my life to do, which was to sort of document what was happening to me. Because everybody who has had anything to do with the FIVs knows that it's, it's not exactly fun. It's not a fun ride, and it takes years and years. And it's something that we're not used to talk about. It's sort of like one of the last taboos in our society because people don't hesitate talking about you know, sex and drugs and, and rock and roll, but when it comes to involuntary childlessness, it's still something that we hesitate to you know, bring into conversation. So I did this series and I was hesitating if I should release it or not, and then a curator friend of mine, Susan Bright, was doing a exhibi an exhibition for the Photographer's Gallery on motherhood. And she convinced me actually to, to show these works. And I'm glad she did because I think I, I realized that this is something that this series is actually giving a voice to a lot of people like myself who, who have experienced this, this issue. Um, and I wanted to do a book with the series, so I went to, to my graphic designer with the pictures, and he said, you need something more. You need an open beginning, and you need an open end, so bring me more pictures. And that's where Carpe Fucking Diem happened. I went into my hard drives, I was digging into what else I had, 
So I brought him like 200 more pictures and that's where we sort of together composed the series. I'm sorry, that was a bit long. <laughs> that's good, it's perfect. Um, and actually I was wondering because uh, I have the feeling that in the book um, uh, the style is a bit different um, than, uh, than before because the photograph seems a bit more snapshot-like. Uh, um, is this a deliberate choice or how did, and it also fits the title of course, Carpe Diem and snapshot-like. So. Why did you choose for that? Yeah, well, that was another thing. I, my, I have to, you know, I'm making always this eloge to my graphic designer who is actually from the city. His name is Stein van der Heiden. And uh, I told him that I want you to make me a book that makes me look 15 years younger than I am. Because, you know, I felt that my previous books had been a bit classical. You know, I was kind of hitting the middle age part of life and I wanted to kind of be more, you know, I wanted to seem like, you know, young again. So that's probably where the snapshot thing comes from. Um, I had been taking snapshots like everybody, but I never thought that they could be a part of my, my um, artistic practice or my body of work. But, you know, bringing all that stuff to him, we kind of realized that actually they do fit very well into what I am talking about. And um, you already mentioned that the, the subject that you are um, exploring is kind of a strange word, but um, that it's quite tabooish. Uh, and I was wondering, do you ever restrict yourself in, because it's so autobio, I, I cannot pronounce the word correctly, but autobiographical, no. But um, do you ever restrict yourself? I don't restrict myself at the uh, prise de vue, how do you say that? Mm -hmm. Like taking, taking mm -hmm. pictures, no restrictions, but very strict editing. So I don't release things that I don't feel comfortable with. And the thing is also that once you make a picture into a print or into a book, kind of you put it on the wall, you take five steps away from it and you get detached from it. So there's immediately this distance between myself and the image. So, you know, it's not me, it's a picture. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me, Kim. Um, Maji Tami, uh, as I already said, also from Finland, uh, you present your series uh, White Rabbit Fever at East Wing uh, Gallery from Dubai, and your work uh, cover, uh, covers science and aesthetics, uh, disgust and fascination, and um, um, I was wondering if you uh, could tell us a little bit about um, uh, your um, fascination for uh, decay and death in combination with beauty. Yes, it's been um, kind of a long journey. I'm doing a practice-based PhD in art photography and uh, kind of the initial thing that fascinated me was, it comes from Umberto Eco, kind of this thing that when we know all these things inside a human body, there's blood, there's intestines, there's it's not. All these things we find disgusting, how can we think that the container, that the sack is beautiful? Why does beauty stop at the surface of the skin? And it also combines to this Julia Kristeva's theory of on abject, like how things, when they're out of context, for example, hair is super nice to touch on someone's head, but the moment it's off, it becomes something disgusting, although the hair itself, mm -hmm. it's still the hair. And um, in your uh, series White Rabbit Fever, um, you combine this disgust and fascination for decay um, with beauty um, by making up kind of a story. Can you tell us a little bit about that, about the narrative? Yeah, the whole title of White Rabbit Fever, it's not an actual disease. Rabbit fever would be, but uh, it's a kind of a connotation to Lisa in the Wonderland and it's this um, kind of a fantastic uh, view on it. There's um, 
There's this theory on aesthetic disgust, and um, it's a theory where things that disgust us, they also fascinate us at the same time, and the disgust can be, sometimes, not always, a way to draw us in, to kind of pull us, look at the picture longer, to kind of uh, capture us in it. Mm -hmm. And what do we see? Oh, sorry. Can you help me with this? Because it's... Ah, here. What do we see here? You cannot see it, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that we can see day 17. So that's like the 17th day from when the rabbit was uh, died. And I followed the rabbit for 100 days. Every day I went back to take a photo of it. And it's combined with this? Yes, this is, there's a X amount of different definitions for death. We have clinical death, biological death, brain death, and all sorts of different definitions. And there's uh, alive stem cells have been found in human bodies, 17 days old. And this is actually bio cell line. And uh, the person was a Finnish teenager. She died in 1983 and her cells are still alive and growing and dividing. Because normal human cells can divide up to 40 to 60 times and we get old, we die. That's how our, uh, our time perspe uh, perspective is linked to our mortality. But cancer cells, in theory, they can divide forever. They're, they never get old. They can just go on, of course, provided the nutrients. And these are uh, laboratory images of mm -hmm. cells. And you photograph these in very, yeah. Uh, restricted areas, laboratories. Uh, how did it go? How did you, um, how did you get access to that, and how did you, uh, you know, work on the spot? Uh, it may be helped because I've done another series where I've photographed cut out cancers and gallstones and everything in hospitals. But all you need to do is find a pr retired professor <laughs> who likes art very much. <laughs> and happens to work in a laboratory, so he gave me access to everything and helped me actually for four months to to test and grow and manipulate the cells as well to get the images I wanted. Thank you very much. It's an intriguing uh, series. Thank you. And thank you, Elena. <laughs> and then I would like to invite Oscar Schmidt and uh, Roger Eberhardt to the stage. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Oscar Schmidt, um, sitting next to me, uh, born in 1977 in Germany. Um, and um, for your recent series, you fully embrace uh, Photoshop. Um, and uh, the title of your new series is Liquid and is presented at Parotta Contemporary Art from Germany. Um, first of all, where's the title? Where does the title refer to? Um, as the, the title "Liquid" uh, refers not only to the some pictures in the series, and you have some uh, water pictures with water streams, and but uh, there you have uh, really uh, water, liquid water, and but the title not only refers to this fact but also to the fact that uh, digital image, images are um, made and modified uh, fluidly in our digital age. That mm -hmm. was the idea behind the title Liquid. Yeah, and also the Photoshop, that the tool is called yeah, Liquidity, uh, no? Uh, liquify, it's liquify. Uh, the, the, the title, and it's um, a tool uh, which used uh, often in uh, f um, to make uh, fashion photography or um, advertising photography, and you can um, move uh, directly the, the pixels of the of the image. It's uh, another kind of collage where you you can uh, move directly the forms, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a fascinating tool. <laughs> mm -hmm. And. Um, um 
now you're quite uh, open about using Photoshop. It's quite clear when you look at the images. Uh, yeah. But your previous uh, series called uh, the American series, yeah. um, you also used Photoshop for that, but it was a bit hidden. Can you explain to us what, yeah. how that looked like, yeah. what it was? Um, that's true in my um, series before, the American series, it was more a uh, hidden part. So I start to uh, restage a uh, scenery of uh, Walker Evans scenery in my studio. I rebuilt this uh, sceneries in uh, life size and uh, I start to put some um, objects in this, uh, or I restage uh, the objects in this uh, photographs directly by myself and uh, later I start to to combine uh, different uh, negatives, so I delete some uh, object, but it was uh, you didn't see it on the first few, and it was so it was uh, really a hidden part. And uh, in my new series, Liquid, I I was uh, make it more precise and open. Mm -hmm. And uh, by um, the image is quite clear and uh, and bright. Um, and uh, the backdrops and colors are very important in this, uh, this body of works. Um, and they seems th it seems that they have something to do with advertisement uh, as well, or with the, the visual language of that. Uh, was you inspired by that, or how? Yes, uh, absolutely. I was inspired by the aesthetic of uh, stock photography, for example, or advertising photography but um, more in this uh, stock photography and the backgrounds I painted by myself. I, I mix uh, the color and uh, paint it and that are not uh, regular backdrops, photographic backdrops, it, they are, uh, that are walls which are painted by myself so I mix uh, very special uh, colors and you have not the regular uh, photo backdrop colors. Ah, so you painted like the, with craftsmanship. Yes. So yes. this is not uh, done with Photoshop. No, no, course. this is uh, real analog. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but and, um, for me, you have a, if you do it only with Photoshop, you have a very clean uh, surface. And uh, if you see the, the photographs in, in life, you see that there is a, a structure. So it's not so uh, dead like an. Mm -hmm. uh, totally digital uh, Photoshop uh, background. Mm -hmm. So in your previous series and in this series, um, you use Photoshop, but you always you combine it with building um, yeah, things in the studio, actually. Yes, yeah. Um, I started also with an, uh, to photograph with an analog large um, camera, and then I scan the negatives and uh, start to, uh, to build the image uh, digitally. So the, uh, the ground, it's uh, analog, but later I, I work and work a uh, long time with the computer and it's, uh, the surface uh, getting more and more uh, digital, but the ground, it's, uh, it's analog. And it's, uh, for me, it's, it's a border between uh, analog and uh, digital, but at the end, it's uh, a totally uh, digital uh, construct. Mm -hmm. And when did you, is this series now finished? I suppose so, because there is um, a book. Uh, no, I'm, uh, I'm working a long time in, uh, at a complex of, uh, of work and uh, I was uh, starting with the still lives, kind of uh, still lives, and uh, then uh, I photographed more persons, like uh, mm -hmm. that what you can see. And I de developed at the moment this uh, human aspect of the, of the series. I, um, Photograph more uh, more persons, and so it's, uh, the series is uh, developing okay. at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, to you, uh, Roger. Roger Eberhardt, born in 1984 in Switzerland. Um, uh, you travel to 32 hotels um, across the world to investigate the function of architecture as social and transient space. And um, I was so uh, intrigued by the fact that the bulk of your 
bodies of work is shot within one, one month, uh, one, year. one year. Yeah. Really? Oh, I was, I was really. Sorry to let this you down. This was my the the key of my talk with you, but <laughs> I um, I misunderstood. Uh, and you you travel to all these uh, countries and then you photographed um, hotels um, and your your work is called uh, your body of work is called standard. Uh, I was wondering what was the most interesting hotel you visit and why? I, well, I guess interesting in itself is probably the, the one that stands out the most was probably the one in Hanoi in Vietnam because it just looks very different from the rest. Of, the book is called Standard and all the rooms look very much alike and the, the one in Hanoi doesn't really look like the others because it has a really crazy wallpaper um, but there's as the series is called standard there's nothing really to be you know, surprising me when thinking of the hotel rooms because they do look very much alike everywhere we go mm -hmm. um, so maybe the views were more exciting and, and surprising at times it's like the guessing game you, you see the building from the outside then you go in and and maybe the view surprises you, but so, the room's not so much. No, I thought so, but <laughs> it's nice to hear you telling that there was at least one room that was a bit uh, different. Um, you create typologies of these uh, hotel rooms and the views, and uh, you present these in a very plain and straightforward uh, way. Um, and in this sense, you stand in the strong Ger German tradition of uh, the beggars. Uh, how do you relate? How do you relate to to them? Um, do you feel a strong connection, uh, or not at all? No, of course. Uh, it'd be denying that would be quite foolish when you look at them. The, it is a typology of rooms. It's also a typology of, of views. And I think Hela Becher said once that for them the typology was the only way of of comparing. So it's it's if you if you think of an analytical way of showing things. Um, a typology is an easy way of comparing one with another and that's exactly what I do. By comparing them and by having an image, by, by having the images look um, are similarly composed, you can start actually seeing that they, they, they don't vary that much. And you can then see in which countries are they playing with what artifacts and, and where is, are the small differences and where are the sort of the local aspects of, of um, interior design pushing through. Um, and in my opinion, and I guess in the Becher's opinion or in Blossfeld before, it's only by the means of typology and repetition that you can actually compare these. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think the main theme of your work uh, are the, yeah, the, the social implications of housing and how we think in general about uh, dwelling uh, dwellings. Uh, are you already thinking about uh, a project which is uh, again concerned with this? What is your next project? Or uh, is this not finished yet? The, no, the, the, this project is finished, but the book is coming out next week. Or yeah, but he also has a book and it's not finished. <laughs> yeah, but I, I traveled to 32 countries last year and I'm done traveling. Um, actually, I don't have a next project. I have an idea. This is the third project that deals with hotels as a placeholder for, to talk about dwellings and, talking about, and to, to talk about housing. And I have a vague idea of, of something else I'd like to talk about with hotels, um, but I'm also taking a bit of a break. I run a small publishing business and I want to publish more books next year and and now have this work, sort of do it wandering around and see where it leads. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you both. Thank you. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Put Put uh, to the stage and also Joya de Bruyne. Um, 
put uh, Stefan and Ulrich. Welcome. Um, I would like to begin with you. Um, you work at the intersection of photography, sculpture and uh, design and everyday objects plays a, a very important role in your body of work. And um, at uh, Galerie Esther Woerdenhof you present your series Paint uh, Rollers. Um, first of all, could you tell us how the two of you uh, met? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, we met in Copenhagen about uh, six years ago. Uh, I think Stefan was moving there from Switzerland um, uh, uh, to work as a graphic designer and I was working in the same studio uh, at that time. Uh, and I guess we just became friends, started talking about uh, sort of common interests and uh, figured out that, uh, that we have uh, sort of a similar aesthetic. Uh, similar. And what is this similar aesthetic? Well, I think we're very much interested in, in everyday objects, uh, very much interested in sort of uh, reducing ideas to sort of the very essence of something. Um, yeah, almost like a, trying to condense an idea or a concept into to sort of a, a very reduced uh, expression. And um, can you tell us a little bit about your, uh, and I, I suppose that this question has been asked a lot, but I'm asking you again, uh, how is your working mo method when you're working with two instead of one person? Yeah, it is a question we do. Yeah, he yeah. always, <laughs> that, that's like your, <laughs> it's his task to I, answer the question. I do the talking. <laughs> no, I, of course it's a question that we've come across before and it's super difficult to answer somehow because in some cases it might be one of us that has an idea and then of course we elaborate on that idea together. Um, more sort of practically, I think we supplement each other really well sort of with Stefan has a, uh, an amazing sort of technical knowledge uh, and I think I'm more the, the hunter and gatherer who sort of goes on hunts for, for all of these uh, objects that we use. Um, so it's a very, it's very democratic and It's a and democratic easy. process yeah. and uh, you don't, um, you don't have like a big ego I suppose because uh, or do well, you have fights? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't call it fights, but uh, sort of uh, uh, interesting discussions. <laughs> that was very diplomatic, but uh, no, not fights. I think in, in the end we always, uh, we always agree. And mm -hmm. um, when you look at your images, um, they're very um, yeah, clear and graphic uh, in a way um, and uh, they also refer a bit to advertisement. Um, do you work in advertisement as well or? interesting question for us because we, we do a lot the object itself becomes very important to us and in the end the, the expression the photography is just a medium for us so all the objects which we do um, they, they physically exist so in the end when here we just use a white background um, so we discussed a lot how can we show this object in the best possible way that the idea comes very clear and that it's not modeled by anything else so that's why, it, in the end, it's quite clear and clinical, if you want to call it like, like that. But, I mean, Ulrich works in fashion design, I work in graphic design, I think we're definitely influenced by our trade, if you want to say it like that. Mm -hmm. This co uh, series is called uh, Paint Rollers, it's quite clear why, I, I guess, but uh, can you tell me about um, the morning or the evening that the idea came up? We, 
will do something with on the theme of paint rollers? I, I can't pinpoint the exact <laughs> moment, but I, I think it's, uh, I mean, we're very interested in sort of things that seem quite effortless in a way. But I think it, it's also quite deceptive. Uh, I mean, this, uh, this project has been researched for maybe two years. It's taken, yeah, two, two and a half years to actually collect and source and find all of these different paint rollers and different objects. So, so in spite of the, yeah, the, the effortless expression that we're trying to achieve, there's a, a lot of work behind it. Uh, and also, it's it's super important for us to um, that things are produced physically, that that we're not uh, yeah, manipulating. I mean, everything takes place in front of the camera. Yeah, I mean, the, what we're showing here today is is uh, or what we're showing with the gallery is um, is a small excerpt of of this series. There are, I think, sixty five images in total so it's a yeah a larger collection sort of a fictional typology you can call it or do you always work with these larger collections uh, yeah. or do you or I is the single image uh, also important for you in some cases single images are also important but for this particular project it was uh, important to exhaust the idea to, to, to reach a point where, okay, we, we can't think of anything else that, that could be combined to resemble a paint roller. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Joya uh, de Bruyne. Um, hello, uh, from the Netherlands. Um, you went to the USA to shoot your uh, new body of work uh, that you are presenting at Flatland uh, Gallery. Um, and I think it's quite uh, courageous to make a photographic road trip um, in a country that has such a strong uh, tradition in this uh, genre. Uh, why did you decide uh, to go for it? Well, um, I think it's because I'm obsessed with states. Um, I think it's a land that's ridiculous, but also ridiculously photogenic. So there's a reason why people always go to America to do this road trip and to do you know, the, the same sort of pictures. And I think that is um, why maybe some people might not like it, but it's also why it's, a, it's an awesome challenge for a photographer to go do yet again the same thing and to try to make it a little bit different, you know, to not have those stereotypical shots that everybody has. I really look, like, try to look for, for contrast within pictures. I try to look for a bit of humor always, because, you know, it's got to stay fun for everybody. Um, and so I think my fascination from the States is just, it's, it's never ending. And I, I made a lot of uh, black and white work there before. And I never really shot a lot of color except for on Polaroids. Mm -hmm. And um, when you, uh, that's, that's not color. <laughs> yeah, so yours Polaroids. I actually started doing Polaroids in color in the States uh, a couple of years ago. And um, because I shoot with a very sort of like difficult to maneuver Polaroid camera, I always had to really think about what I was doing and I wanted a little bit more flexibility so that's why I went uh, this time with my Hasselblad and, uh, and did it that way. It's not a lot of the USA work on here. Yeah. Okay. It is. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's that was not in America. This. <laughs> that was, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I have the feeling that traveling is very important uh, for you, um, in your, for your work, uh, but also in your life. Uh, uh, did you always have the urge to be on the move? or? Well, I think it happened uh, a little bit organically. My, I grew up in the Caribbean, and my parents still live there. And if you want to leave, Cur I live in, live in Curacao, if you live in Curacao, you have to like take a boat or take a plane to go anywhere you can. You know, living in a small town but you really have to like travel to get out mm -hmm. so um, 
after high school, I went, I moved to Amsterdam, and my brother moved to Miami, and my sister moved to Switzerland, so my parent, my, my parents are still in Curacao, so my whole family is everywhere, so I have to actually travel to see my family, just something basic, like seeing family, you have to travel. And I think um, because of that, I never really traveled to places with the intent to see the place. I kind of in, uh, traveled to places with the intent to connect with somebody. And then on the way, you're just looking around. And I, uh, I, I, I'm I, always looking around. And <laughs> I try to see beauty in things that are maybe a little bit banal uh, most of the time. And I think that's probably a common theme in most of my work. It's not so much the travel aspect of it. It's so much just the finding home in it. Because that's basically, I'm always looking for home. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. And um, you have an analog approach of uh, photography. Yes. Um, this is, of course, a deliberate choice, I suppose. Uh, or? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. it started. Um, when I got into photographer, when I was young, I always had disposable cameras and I was always documenting everything when I was like 14, 15 years old, never thinking I would be a photographer. And then by the time that I went to art school, it was all digital. And um, I didn't think that I should start photographing digitally before I knew actually what all the settings on the camera meant. You know, like, you, I think that you need to explore the craft of the analog uh, business before or that's what anyway, my opinion was, and then I just, I never went back. I, I had the intention to just learn analog first and then go back to digital, but it just had so much more soul. I, I, I process all my own stuff and I try to print as much as possible. So it's like, they're really my babies. And so uh, yeah, that's what it is. I love them, they're my babies. <laughs> And you, you said like when you was photographing in the US, USA that you um, worked in color uh, and you was not so experienced in, uh, in that. Um, how did you find it? <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, uh, it was yeah, well, it, it, I think it turned out okay. <laughs> Basically, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, the only uh, color experience I've ever had was with disposable cameras. Mm -hmm. And there you, you you have no settings, so you know you, you point and you shoot, and that's it. And um, working with color on film is really a much different process than black and white is, because um, black and white I've been doing it for so long, and I have my my whole process worked out, and I you know I have certain ways of getting the exact look that I wanted. And and with color, I was starting with a clean slate because I didn't have any ideas of what I wanted my colors to look like. And I, I, I kind of, I don't like color very much, so, I mean, I, I like photographs now, but I'm not, like, I don't, I try not to wear too much color because it kind of overwhelms me. And I think that's um, something that I have with a lot of digital photography as well, is that it, it gets really busy, like, and, it, and, it, and I want my photos to be sort of like a, a, a point of calm for myself and also for people looking at them to sort of escape their daily life because that's why I take them and if it gets really colorful and really intense then then that then I'm not then I'm missing the point so try to do it a little bit more toned down I think that's what it comes down to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to uh, all the artists and uh, also thanks thanks to you the uh, the audience. Thanks a lot. Thank you.